Good afternoon, everyone. This is TransConnect February 2024, and today we'll be talking about therapeutic plasma exchange and as per guidelines. We have already had a top topic on therapeutic plasma exchange where we discussed the secondary plasma device. Today we'll be talking about the ASPA guidelines, which is like a ready reckoner for all our transfusion medicine specialists. We'll discuss about the ASPA guidelines at length. We'll be discussing how it is different from the previous guidelines. So over to Dr. Jaya, who is going to be talking about this important topic. Good afternoon, everyone. ASPA guidelines. ASPA stands for the American Society for Apheresis. The Journal of Clinical Apheresis, JCA, has a writing committee who is in charge with reviewing, updating, and categorizing the indications for the evidence-based use of therapeutic apheresis in diseases. This committee incorporates systemic review and evidence-based approaches in the grading of evidence and thereby categorizing the indications to make recommendations on how and when to use apheresis in a wide range of diseases. Indications for therapeutic apheresis falls under four categories. The diseases for which apheresis is accepted as a first line of therapy, either solo or along with other modes of treatment, fall under category 1. The disorders for which apheresis is accepted as a second line of therapy, either as standalone treatment or in conjunction with other modes of treatment, fall under category 2. The diseases in which optimal role of apheresis therapy is not established falls under category 3. Here, the usage of apheresis should be individualized. The disorders in which apheresis has been proven to be ineffective or worse, harmful, falls under category 4. Based on the strength of the recommendation and the quality of evidence, the indications are classified into grades. Grades stands for Grading of Recommendations Assessment, Development and Evaluation System. Indications that have a strong recommendation falls under grade 1. Grade 1 can further be classified into 1A, 1B and 1C based on the quality of evidence, high, moderate and low respectively. So, a randomized controlled trials without important limitations falls under high quality evidence. RCTs with important limitations falls under moderate quality evidence and observational studies or case series fall under low quality evidence. An indication which is said to have strong recommendation implies that therapeutic apheresis can be applied to most patients under most circumstances. Indications that have weak recommendation falls under grade 2. Grade 2 can further be classified into 2A, 2B and 2C based on the quality of evidence, high, moderate and low. Same as grade 1, RCTs without limitations falls under high quality evidence. RCTs with important limitations falls under moderate evidence and observational studies fall under low quality evidence. Weak recommendation implies that the therapeutic apheresis and its usage depends on the patient. How to refer as for guidelines? Now there is a table titled Category and Grade Recommendations for Therapeutic Apheresis. The first column comprises of the disease or conditions in alphabetical order followed by the second column which has the indication within the disease for which apheresis is recommended. The next column is the list of procedures, whether it is therapeutic plasma exchange or immunoadsorption or RBC exchange, etc. The next two columns have the category and the grade, whether they fall under category 1, 2, 3 or 4 and grade 1, 2, A, B, C, whichever grade the disease falls in. The last column is the page number where we can go and refer the fact sheet. We have a list of general issues that we should consider when evaluating a new patient for therapeutic apheresis. First is the rational, the most important thing. What is the rational or principle behind using apheresis in this disease? Next is the impact. What will the effect of therapeutic apheresis be on the disease, on the patient, medications, comorbidities, etc.? Next is the technical issue. How much volume of uh, replacement fluid we should use? What should be the vascular access? How much whole blood can be processed, etc. Next is the therapeutic plan. How many apheresis procedures should we do? In what interval should we do? Daily, alternate days, etc. The next most important thing is the endpoint, either clinical or laboratory endpoint. When we should stop doing therapeutic apheresis? 
The last thing is the timing and location. Whether it is an emergency procedure or a routine procedure, whether it should happen in a ward or an intensive care unit or in the operating room. Now, all these issues can be considered when we go through the fact sheet of each indication. Now, this is the structure of a fact sheet. The first column will contain the name of the disease or the condition. That is the column A. The area B will show the incidence or prevalence of the disease. The area C will show the indication, the indication within the disease for which apheresis is recommended. The area D will show the type of procedure, plasma exchange, red cell exchange, etc. Column E will show the category 1, 2, 3 or 4. Area F will show the grade recommendation that is 1A, 1B, 1C or 2A, 2B and 2C. The area G will show the number of patients reported in literature. And the subsequent areas that is H, I, J and K will show whether, will show the number of RCTs, randomized control trial, control trials, case series and case reports. The area L shows the description of the disease or condition. That is, what is the disease, its signs and symptoms, its pathophysiology, etc. The area M describes the therapeutic modalities available apart from therapeutic apheresis, the medications, etc. to treat the disease or condition. The area N has the rational, the most important thing. Why should we do therapeutic apheresis in this condition? What impact the therapeutic apheresis has on the disease, the patient and how will it help treat the patient? The area O will have some technical notes of performing the therapeutic apheresis in this specific condition. The area P will have the volume treated, that is how many plasma volumes are required. The area Q will have the type of replacement fluid, whether it is albumin or plasma. The area R will have the proposed frequency of treatment, whether it is daily or alternate days. The area S yes, will have the duration and discontinuation, the end point for apheresis. P has the keywords and U has the references. This is an example of a fact sheet for myasthenia gravis. As you can see, the incidence is mentioned. In indications, we have two. One is the acute short-term treatment and the other is the long-term treatment. The category at which each indication falls in, the reported patients, the description of the disease, as in the signs and symptoms, etc. The current management, that is anti cholinesterase inhibitors, thymectomy, immunosuppression, etc. The rational, why do we use therapeutic apheresis in this condition? What does it do to this disease? Next is the technical notes, as in the plasma volume to be used, replacement fluid, frequency, etc. And when to discontinue the procedure, followed by keywords and references. Now, the previous issue of ASFA guidelines was released in 2019, which is the 8th edition. And the latest edition was issued in 2023, which is the 9th edition. Now, the latest edition has 91 diseases and 166 indications respectively. There has been some wording changes, that is, overdose envenomation and poisoning was changed to acute toxins, venoms and poisoning. There were some name changes, that is, amyloidosis systemic was changed to amyloidosis systemic dialysis related. Red cell aluminization prevention and treatment was changed to red blood cell aluminization pregnancy complications. Coagulation factor inhibitors was changed to coagulation factor deficiency and inhibitors. There were some language updates. Places where cardiac and renal was used, it was changed into heart and kidney diseases. Two indications were upgraded, that is erythropoietic protoporphyria was initially in category 3, now increased to category 2. Inflammatory bowel disease ulcerative colitis was in category 2, increased to category 1. Four indications were downgraded. Age-related macular degeneration was initially in category 2, now in category 3. Severe babesiosis was initially in category 2, now in category 3. Hyperleukocytosis was also initially in category 2, now in category 3. Red blood cell alloimmunization pregnancy complications, RHT alloimmunization topic was initially in category 3, now in category 4. Vasculitis ANCA associated. The indications are now separated by pathology, that is microscopic polyangitis, 
granulomatosis with polyangiitis and these both pathologies are now in category 3 irrespective of the presence of diffuse alveolar hemorrhage or their creatinine levels the following diseases are no longer included in the 9th edition amyloidosis caused other than dialysis amyotrophic lateral sclerosis dermatomyositis or polymyositis health syndrome idiopathic polyarthritis nodosa inclusion body myositis multifocal motor neuropathy etc the following diseases are incorporated into new fact sheets in in this latest edition alzheimer's autoimmune dysautonomia idiopathic inflammatory myopathies paraneoplastic autoimmune retinopathies intestinal transplant etc the following diseases are incorporated into existing fact sheets in this latest edition mechanical hemolysis has been incorporated into acute toxins venoms and poison meth hemoglobinemia has also been incorporated bone marrow necrosis or fat embolism syndrome has been incorporated into acute sickle cell disease fact sheet thank you so much